Good evening, everybody. I'm James Heimowitz. I'm the president of China Institute, and it's a delight to welcome all of you here for this really important discussion that we're about to have um, this evening. For those of you that don't know China Institute, we were founded in 1926, so we've been around for nearly 100 years with the aim of helping America better understand China through language, through art, through culture, through business practices. And it strikes me with the recent violence towards Asians in America that the root element and the root cause of all this can only be defined in one way. The reason that people have become violent has to be attributed to ignorance. Um, and I think the only way to address the root cause of this kind of violence and hate crimes is by connecting people at a human level and trying to you know, minimize that level of ignorance. And it's funny, I was talking to the people, uh, my senior team at China Institute, and we were talking about this. And we said, you know, if you're thinking about cancer and a cure for cancer, it all has to begin with basic science and basic research. If you're talking about violence directed at Asians in America, it all has to start with educating people, making them more aware and more understanding. Um, China and the United States are probably the two most important countries to occupy the planet, and we need to share the planet. And our shared future depends on interdependence, depends on us understanding each other better. Um, and tonight, with this in light, we're in for a very special evening. We're in for an evening that's going to help us sort of put a little bit of perspective around the present situation that we find us in. And for those of you who are joining us tonight after you listen, I encourage you to think about participating in the various classes, events, programs, and things that we do at China Institute, which will give you the skills and the information that you need to navigate our future, whether it's learning about learning Chinese language or understanding how Chinese people appreciate food and cuisine. Um, I can't think of a better place for to, to stop the ignorance. So I want to say a big thank you to our panelists this evening. And I'd like to hand over this evening's discussion to the head of our public programs at China Institute, Dinda Elliott. Okay, thank you, James. Um, and welcome everybody. Uh, let's, you know, we're going to start this evening's conversation with the latest information from Pew Research Center. Uh, Laura Silver, who's a senior researcher at Pew, will share with us their uh, recent survey statistics. And, and then after that, we're going to have a conversation with our three other speakers. Uh, joining us are John Pomfret, longtime China journalist and author of several books, including The Beautiful Country and the Middle Kingdom, which takes a very deep look at the US, the relationship between the United States and China over the centuries. Um, we have Erica Lee, a leading historian of Chinese immigration and also an author of several books, including The Making of Chinese of Asian America and America for Americans. Uh, and we also have Catherine Pan, who runs the China practice at Dorsey and Whitney. So um, I'm going to hand it over to Laura. I think the rest of us will turn off our cameras and mute ourselves for a few minutes while Laura shares with us the Pew Research Center's recent uh, survey. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to present these data to you and to join in this conversation. Before I get started, just a little bit about who we are. The Pew Research Center is a nonprofit fact tank, and our goal is to inform the public about issues, attitudes, and trends shaping the world. We're nonpartisan and non-advocacy, so we don't take policy positions. We're primarily funded by the Pew Charitable Trusts. A bit about the methodology of what I'm gonna to present to you today. We did a nationally representative survey with a little more than 2,500 US adults at the beginning of February of this year. Everyone who took part is a member of our Center's Maintained American Trends Panel. We conduct the survey online, but it's recruited through national random sampling. Happy to talk more about methodology if that's of interest, particularly in the question and answer. And the survey is weighted to be representative of the full US population. So let's get started with the key finding. Views of China have turned increasingly negative. What you're looking at here is a feeling thermometer where we ask people to place themselves on a, um, on a thermometer where zero is the coldest rating you can give to China and 100 is the warmest rating. 
And in 2021, we found that 47% of people gave China a rating below 25. Another 20% gave it a rating below 50, which is the neutral point. Only 20% gave China a neutral rating and 11% gave China a rating of 51 or above. These are very negative views and they're also up substantially in terms of the percent who give China a cold rating since only 2018. Really sharp rise, including in the percentage of people who gave China a zero, which rose from around 7% in 2018 to around a quarter of Americans in 2021. So with 101 possible ratings, around a quarter of Americans gave China a zero on this scale. It's important to note that this sharp decrease in views of China or this increased cold sentiment is only happening when it comes to China compared to other countries in the Asia Pacific. Here you're looking at the mean ratings given to four different countries. And you can see that views of China at this point are not much higher than views of North Korea. And they're quite a bit colder than views of India or Japan. To look a little bit under the hood at who gives negative ratings to China, one consistent pattern that we'll see is that older people tend to have more negative feelings towards China. You can see that around three quarters of people 50 and older give China a cold rating compared to 60% of those under 50. There are very few age differences to speak of though, and there are sharp partisan differences. Republicans are much more likely to have a cold feeling towards China, 79% take this position, though 61% of Democrats, so still a majority, do have cold feelings towards China. You'll also see that conservative Republicans stand out from moderate or liberal Republicans in the depth of their cold feelings. Turning to a different question that we asked about China, you can see that generally speaking, very few Americans consider China to be a partner of the US, 9% take this opinion. 55% consider China a competitor and around a third of Americans consider China to be an enemy. The patterns here are similar to what we just saw on the last set of slides. Older people are much more likely to consider China an enemy than younger people. The educational differences are not particularly pronounced, but here there are even sharper partisan divides. More than half of Republicans, 53%, consider China an enemy compared to only 20% of Democrats. And around two thirds of conservative Republicans in particular consider China an enemy. But one of the questions we often get is, what do people mean when they talk about having cold feelings towards China? China is obviously a multifaceted country with a long history, a deep culture, a complicated government. So we asked Americans in their own words, what do you think about when you think about China? And they could write anything that came to mind. Researchers then created a code book and coded for the first five references that any given individual wrote. Um, and this was obviously fielded in our online survey, so some people wrote a lot. What we then did was we looked at the overall frequencies of what were people thinking about. The top issues that came up when people were asked to talk about China were human rights, the economy, and the political system. Around 20% of people mentioned something to do with human rights, particularly focused on issues of lack of freedoms. So lack of freedom of speech, freedom of religion, or freedom of assembly. 3% of respondents specifically mentioned issues of genocide or Uyghurs or Xinjiang concentration camps. 19% uh, mentioned something to do with the economy. Some of these were factual statements, like China has a very large economy or a high growth rate. Others were more critical about China having bad products or having knockoffs. And then some people just discussed how everything is made in China and it's ubiquitous. You'll see that generally speaking, everything on this slide is largely focused on China as a country or as a government or as its behavior internationally. That's important to note very few people mentioned anything to do with the Chinese people themselves. In fact, only 3% of respondents mentioned anything about the Chinese people. Everything else, for the most part, focused more generally on descriptors of China and the country. It's also important to note that very few people mentioned particularly positive adjectives. Most of them were negative. But we also asked a number of closed-ended questions about what people think about in terms of the bilateral relationship between the US and China and what concerns them about China in particular. Here you can see those items that we asked. So we asked whether or not each one of these issues listed on this slide were a very serious problem, a somewhat serious problem, not too serious of a problem, or not a problem at all for the US. You can see that most of these issues are considered at least somewhat serious by the American public but the depth of the, um, the issue kind of varies across the issues. So 65% of people think that cyber attacks from China is a very serious problem, while around half consider issues like the loss of US jobs to China, um, China's growing military power, and China's policy on human rights to be very serious issues. 
Two issues that are seen as somewhat less likely to be considered very serious are tensions between mainland China and Hong Kong and tensions between mainland China and Taiwan. Importantly though, on most of these issues, concerns about them, the sense that they're very serious, rose substantially just between March of last year and February of this year. But how does China as a foreign policy priority kind of stack up compared to other foreign policy priorities that Americans might value? First, we ask this question about whether limiting China's power and influence should be a top foreign policy priority, a priority, but a lesser, a lesser priority, not a top one or not a priority at all. And you can see that between 2018 and 2021, the percent of Americans who say that limiting China's power and influence should be a top priority grew from 32% to 48%. And while it grew among partisans on both sides of the aisle, it grew more sharply among Republicans from 39% to 63%. In fact, among Republicans, limiting the power and influence of China is a top five priority. It rates above the emphasis Republicans place on any limiting any other power, for example, Iran, North Korea, or Russia, you'll see further down this slide. And it's kind of, it falls only a little bit below some of the other major issues for the party, including reducing illegal immigration into the US. However, among Democrats, it's a much lower priority. You can see that limiting the power and influence of China, for example, is only about as important and slightly less so than limiting the power and influence of North Korea, and quite a bit less important to Democrats than limiting the power and influence of Russia. It's also important to note that Democrats are more likely to generally prioritize promoting and defending human rights in other countries, 42% say this, than limiting the power and influence of China. The reason that's important is, as I'll show you shortly, one of the few issues on which there are no partisan differences when it comes to China is the importance of prioritizing human rights. So I want to talk about some specific policy priorities that Americans hold. We couldn't ask about everything. As people on this call are sure to know, there are a number of different policy priorities people could have when it comes to China. But we asked about three. First is related to economic and trade policy towards China. We asked whether it's more important to get tougher with China on economic issues or to build a strong relationship with China on economic issues. And you can see more Americans today say it's important to get tougher with China, 53%, than to build a strong relationship, 44%. There's some notable patterns that are similar to the other demographic slides we looked at. Older people more likely to say it's important to get tougher, very few educational differences, and then extremely wide partisan differences. 72% of Republicans say it's important to get tougher on China, whereas 60% of Democrats say it's more important to build a strong relationship. Here's the human rights slide I mentioned though. We asked specifically whether or not it's more important to try to promote human rights in China, even if it harms economic relations with China, or to prioritize strengthening economic relations with China, even if it means not addressing human rights. You can see a large majority of Americans, 70%, say it's important to try to promote human rights in China, even at the expense of potential economic problems. And this, as I noted, is one of the few areas where we see bipartisan support. In fact, it's one of the few issues I've ever seen in public opinion recently where conservative Republicans and liberal Democrats agree on the importance of something. Generally speaking, this reflects the fact that Republicans tend to take a tougher line when it comes to China, and Democrats tend to take a tougher line when it comes to human rights more generally. But here is an issue where the two meet. And then particularly appropriate for our discussion tonight, we asked whether or not um, people support or oppose limiting Chinese students studying in the United States. So a people to people type policy. And you can see that a majority of Americans, 55% support limiting Chinese students studying in the US. It's important to note that we asked this question immediately following a question where we had asked whether or not people thought foreign students studying in the US were good or bad for the country. And a large majority of Americans around 80% say it's good. So they just finished saying that foreign students are good, and then they still took the majority position that, um, that limiting Chinese students in the US is something that they support. Again, large variation though. Older people are much more likely to say that they support limiting Chinese students. Here we do see an educational difference where people with less education are more likely to support this proposal. And we also see a very large partisan difference. Republicans are much more supportive of limiting Chinese students than our Democrats. We also see that this is related to attitudes about China. So people who have more negative views of China and especially people who consider China to be an enemy are much more likely to support limiting Chinese students. 
I want to conclude with a slide that's from a different survey that we did also on the same American Trends panel, which looks at specifically how Asian respondents, and these are Asian respondents who are interviewed in English only, but how a sample of Asians in the United States talk about violence against Asians in the US. Among the people who say that violence is increasing, which is a large share, we ask people in their own words what some of these reasons are. And you can see that while 4% is not the, the top answer here, China's rise is something and US-China relations is something that Asian respondents are blaming for the rise of violence against Asian Americans today. It pales in comparison to some of the other issues named like Donald Trump, racism and COVID-19. But it's important to note that generally speaking, there are a substantial number of Asians who specifically look at the rise of China and how that might be affecting um, relations among different racial groups in the US today. So I'll stop there, but I look forward to talking more in the question and answer. Thank you. Wow, so stick around for a second, Laura, before you disappear, um, because those numbers are just incredible. But and I'm wondering, um, you know, I know you're not, uh, you know, in your position, you're not going to be taking expressing uh, opinions about about this stuff. But I wonder if there's evidence that if you see in the research evidence that U.S. policy, that rhetoric coming out of Washington specifically, uh, has affected views in a negative way. I mean, it was interesting. So your last slide kind of suggests that at least the Asian Americans think that I noticed that it was, you know, they attributed 20% of them attributed Trump uh, to the sort of anti, you know, Asian uh, crimes or views or whatever. Um, but I wondered, is, is there evidence uh, for the, you know, broader population that US policy and rhetoric have been influenced, you know, government's rhetoric? It's a great question. So we don't have causal data, so we can't say with certainty. But one thing I like to remind people is there are only a handful of ways people can form opinions about foreign countries. You can have direct experience, which is limited. Um, most Americans don't have direct experience with China and probably it hasn't changed much between 2018 and now when we saw this negative rise in views. Um, you can learn about um, China from books and from education. Again, probably hasn't changed a lot between 2018 and 2021. Um, and most people aren't kind of acquiring new information in their, their general studies about China. So most of it is mediated. And specifically, it's not only what's on the media, but what's coming through trusted elite. So as rhetoric turns more negative, it's likely that views of China will also turn more negative. We've seen in the past that sometimes negative views of China spike around election cycles. And there's some academic evidence that backs this up because people tend to campaign on an anti-China platform. In fact, almost no one campaigns on a pro-China platform, even in this most recent election where we see Biden taking a different stance towards China than the Trump administration, he's still being tough on China or um, figuring out how to leverage the relationship in different ways. He's not saying let's actively cooperate and be partners with China in every way. Um, and so when rhetoric is heated and when it's united from both parties, we are likely to see views of Americans shift in that same direction. So one other question before you go away now, just, just in terms of the specifics. So that, that question about limiting Chinese students in America and particularly following when you said 80% of you know, the respondents said that foreign students is a good thing, but then 55% you know, said they support limiting Chinese students. Was there any further questioning? I'm just curious as to whether there was anything else that suggested why? Like, what is it that Americans fear that these Chinese students are going to do? It was not a ubiquitous answer, but in that same open end that we coded, we did see some references to espionage and to theft of intellectual property and to the sense that we were losing out to China. And I imagine all of those sentiments play a role. The general sense that China is a threat is likely directly related. But unfortunately, we don't have more insight on that particular question, only on the overall question of use of China. Right. Okay. Thank you so much. And please, we want to bring you back for more questions about this at the end. Um, and now I'd love to have John and Catherine and Erica uh, turn on your cameras and unmute yourselves so that we can um, start, you know, our sort of second conversation of the evening. And then we'll have a third one when we turn to Q&A at the end. 
do, by the way, I, I can see that a couple of people I think have already typed some questions into the Q&A section. So that's wonderful. We will take some questions at the end. We'll try to, it's, I'm sure there's a lot of territory to cover, but, but we will definitely try to get some of your questions at the end. So um, John, if you don't mind, I think what we'd really love to do is kind of start with some history. Uh, I think we're gonna start with John giving us um, sort of helping set the stage in terms of the US China uh, relationship over the centuries. Uh, and then we'll get a little bit of history from Erica on uh, Chinese immigration to the US. And then we can have a broader conversation. Catherine can talk about the business, you know, very, um, you know, up to date experiences on the ground uh, dealing with the current um, current issues from a business perspective and a legal perspective. But but so, John, we've been talking about this, um, you know, strong correlation between anti China sentiment and the rise of anti Asian bias. Um, I wonder if you can walk us through a little bit the some of the swings over the centuries between the kind of missionary like drive to change China to help China, etc, on the part of Americans, and then these kind of waves of fear and anti Chinese sentiment. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the nature of the way Americans have viewed China and that relationship? Sure. Th thanks. Thanks, Ben. And thanks so much for having me on this panel. It's a, it's a wonderful group of people that, I, that I'm, I really feel honored to be associated with. So I'm going to try to pack 250 some odd years into five minutes or less. <laughs> and in doing so, I, I want to focus on the early days because so much of what we see today actually has its roots in the past. Americans have looked at China with a mixture of fascination, obsession, fear, and, and also repulsion in varying degrees over the several centuries that we've been interacting. So in the late 1700s, after the United States won independence from Great Britain, the China market was seen as the savior for the young American economy. So the search for goods for the China market sent Americans all over the world. American sailors killed an estimated 5 million fur seals, a quarter of a million sea otters. They felled forests of sandalwood. They harvested tons of sea cucumber for the China market. The idea of a transcontinental railroad in the United States wasn't, didn't first come to Americans to, with the idea of binding the East Coast and the West Coast, it actually was the scheme of an American who'd made a lot of money in Hong Kong to bring what he thought the United States closer to the China market. So from the beginning, Americans were really spellbound with China's potential. And in the halls of power in the United States, the Chinese actually were highly respected by the likes of Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine. And George Washington even thought, he wrote to a friend, that the Chinese were white. So it's kind of this very bizarre sort of belief that, that actually the China market was going to be the savior of the United States. So when the Chinese first began to immigrate to the United States in large numbers and to California after gold was discovered in 1848, they were, they were welcomed at least by some because particularly California desperately needed workers and the Chinese did everything. California businessmen were really awed by their, their industriousness. So in 1868, the Chinese in the United States, China and the United States concluded their first treaty and it was known as the Free Labor Treaty and even opened the United States to the immigration of Chinese workers to America. And at the time, writing in the Nation magazine that the editor, Edwin L. Godkin, he predicted that the, what he called the coming of the barbarians would herald nothing short of an economic revolution, liberating average Americans from the drudgery of everyday work because the Chinese would do it for them. So then two years later, we have one of the original sins in how Americans have, have treated Asians with the 1870 naturalization law was being debated in Congress. And at the time, abolitionists like such as Senator Charles Sumner were calling for Asians to be included in the American family. They wanted Asians also to be naturalized American citizens in addition to whites and to African-Americans, to blacks, but no such luck. Asians lost that, they, they let, some there lost the, the debate and Asians, you couldn't become a naturalized American if you were Asian. So then three, three years later, the American economy faced this depression in 1873 and lacking the vote, and feared because of their grit, the white working class kind of takes its frustrations out against the Chinese in America. And you have this whole new raft, this time of very negative fantasies were unleashed about the Chinese. The Chinese were dirty, they carried disease. Medical professionals such as Hugh Toland, one of the founders of the, United, the UCSF Medical School, even alleged in testimony that the, the syphilis carried by Chinese prostitutes was somehow more deadly than the variant carried by white women. 
So the 1870s, you really see the, the opening of these floodgates of attacks against Chinese. There were massacres across the West in Hell's Canyon, in the Oregon Territory, Los Angeles, Seattle, Tacoma, Rock Springs, Wyoming. A political party, the California Working, Workingmen's Party was even formed, basically its sole platform was expelling the Chinese worker from the United States. And legislation is passed both in California but then also in Washington, banning Chinese laborers from coming to America. That was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. But at the same time, joining this awe and this repulsion, there's, there's this other strain that you alluded to, Dinda, mm -hmm. in America's views of China, which, is, which comes with the missionaries, this large number of Christian missionaries who go from America to China. They begin flocking to China after the end of the Civil War, and they carry with them this belief that China will become the great beneficiary of American education, American largesse, and American culture that the United States through its good works in China will somehow educate and lift up the Chinese and turn them into, initially it was little Christians, and then later it became little capitalists, and then later it became little Democrats. And so all of these contradictory strains that we see in the 18th and 19th century, they continue to this day. We see the repulsion and fear of China manifested in the 1950s. When China turns communist and Americans begin fantasizing that the Chinese thought control, we called it brainwashing, constituted, it, as one writer put it then, psycho psychological warfare on a scale incalculably more immense than any militarist of the past has ever envisioned. I mean, watch the movie The Manchurian Candidate to get a real idea of the fear that Americans had of Chinese thought control. We also see the obsession about the promise of and the potential profits to be made in China in America's reaction to Chinese opening up starting in the late 1970s. I mean, remember, I mean, many people were probably not born then, but in 1981, Bloomingdale's, you know, flagship retail store in America turned the whole store, all eight floors of the store over to Chinese goods. Oh my God, I remember, I remember buying a Mao suit right, at Bloomingdale. Go. <laughs> and, then, and then you also see the missionary impulse repurposed in the American belief, which was pushed by President Clinton in the 1990s, that under American tutelage, China was going to transform itself into a far more liberal, far more capitalist nation than actually it has become. And finally, we see the revulsion of the 19th century return with this COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. where Chinese, once again, you know, Kung flu, the China virus, are being fingered as the repositories of sickness and disease. And so sometimes it seems like we're trapped in kind of this Buddhist cycle of uh -huh. reincarnation in our views of China with each spin of the wheel repurposing of fantasy of either paternalistic love or xenophobic hate. So back in the, um, that's amazing, thank you. That was really quite a tour de force in five minutes sort of doing the sweep of- <laughs> Now you don't have to buy my book. That was really good, exactly. Now we're gonna post in the chat you know how to buy your book and it is an amazing book but i'm really curious going way back okay to franklin and washington and you said that they actually respected the chinese or said various things that were respectful and then you know you get, go into the 1870s where there it's you know the chinese are viewed as being dirty diseased syphilis you know and there are these attacks etc was that what was the reason for that was ma that mainly because of economic, you know, the people were afraid of kind of the Chinese are going to take over our economy or what was going on? It was, it was the white working class. Um, to right. be very blunt. And it was the, the union organized white working class. If you look at union circulars from the 19, even from as late as the 1930s, union circulars, it's like, you should join the AFL-CAO because we blocked millions and millions of Asians from coming to our country, either Japanese or Chinese from coming to America and stealing your jobs. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's, I actually have a union circular from that, from that date. And there it is, you know, we, we we're protecting you because we're protecting you from Asian competition. Yeah. And yeah. You, you see that kind of repurposed in the seventies in our debates about Japan, uh -huh. right? I mean, the, the murder of Vin, Vincent Chin, right? Over Japanese sort of, you know, illegal economic practices, which was very similar to kind of repurpose this debate about how industrious the Asians were compared to compared to white working class. And right, so it right. was fired, fueled by, and, and, and interestingly enough, the Republican party in the 19th century was far more supportive of Chinese immigration into the United States. And some of the strongest legal representation that the Chinese mm -hmm. community had were from Republican po politicians. And what were, you know, let's look, take a slightly, let's pause for a second to look at the more modern era. So starting from 1949, say, yeah. what were the sort of touch points since 49 in terms of 
uh, the swings back and forth, uh, you know, in which which the U.S. views of China shifted from one. Starting to in 1949, of course, you had this huge "Who Lost China" debate, right? Yeah. And the McCarthyist attack on uh, all the Reds under the bed, and that was particularly harsh in the Chinese communities and in Chinatown, where the nationalist government and its representatives would would go after and actually cooperated with the U.S. Justice Department in outing left wing Chinese. And mm -hmm. people were arrested, hounded out of the country. And so that was kind of one touch point. Uh, and then you have the beginning of the 1960s and the student movement in America who were very interested in the thoughts of Chairman Mao. Yeah. And the Black, the, the Black Panther Party basically used to, used to make a significant portion of its income by selling Mao's Little Red Book. <laughs> and so you then you had so so at one time you have sort of the the, the China the, the fear factor, but then you also had the obsession factor. Mm -hmm. And then of course we had the great opening to China led by Richard Nixon, yeah. uh, which then touched off another moment of huge interest in China. Right, mm -hmm. everyone wearing Mao suits, people wearing Mao caps, Bloomingdale's turning its supermarket, I mean, a retail store over to Chinese goods, mm -hmm. and this belief that my goodness, we've rediscovered China. Uh, and but then you again re repurpose this missionary zeal of okay now China's back in our in our in our you know uh, in, in our in our hug and we can begin to kind of repurpose and recontinue our missionary goal to bring China into the modern world. Mm -hmm. And then 1989, June 4th, the crackdown, another touch point, saying mm -hmm. oh my God, the Chinese, uh, how could they do this to their students? And then you have this revulsion kind of kick in. Mm -hmm. And then China then re, re, resumes its economic progress and its reforms in the mid 1990s. And then you, again, you repurpose a la Bill Clinton. Oh my goodness, these people are gonna pretty soon, once they choose between Pepsi and Coke, they're gonna wanna choose their leadership and they're gonna become yeah. more like us. Yeah. And then you have under the Obama administration, this like, oh my goodness, they're not actually liberalizing as quickly as we thought we, they would. Um, and and the, the revulsion begins to kick in, which then Donald Trump adds a huge dose of accelerant to that, mm -hmm. um, adding a racial xenophobic aspect to it as well with the Kung flu and the China virus and all that. And then you really have this thing on steroids now, which is mm -hmm. a very negative trend right What's now. What's so interesting about it, before we bring Erica on to talk about Chinese um, immigration to the US, you know, is there, there seems to be such an emotional relationship with China. In other words, you know, you and I were in, in Beijing in the, you know, 1988, 1989, et cetera. And there was this feeling, of course, that we all felt like kind of, it was a little bit of kind of, oh my God, China might become like us. And then the feeling of sort of rejection and almost feeling, you know, like our hearts were broken um, when that didn't happen. And, and, you know, you talked about Obama and in recent years, realizing that China is not as sort of changing as fast as we hoped it would, but there is, is always this sort of sense that they're somehow, it's inevitable that they are going to become like us or that we think they will. Yeah, I mean, you have this, this I mean, Americans obviously have no shortage of self-regard <laughs> and Chinese, Chinese as well as a society and a culture have no shortage of self-regard. Yeah. You have two massive continental powers, which we both are, we're kind of almost the same size in terms of our area. Mm -hmm. um, and and there's, there's a lot of shared, I mean, we're, for example, we in many ways relate to China, the, the Chinese more easily than we relate to the Japanese. The Japanese are an island nation. It's a sort of a completely different vibe. Mm -hmm. Whereas the Chinese are a big continental power. And there's a, there's a and I think there's, there's something natural in that and natural in the, but, and also then, then given America's missionizing uh, tendencies, yeah. We naturally tend to bring that to China. And so we, we've deeply emotionalized, if you will, the relationship with China. Yeah. I mean, no other country, I think, in the United States, other than perhaps Great Britain, stimulates as deep an emotional kind of twinge as, yeah. our, as does our relationship with China. Yes, 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 definitely. Um, so Erica, John, stay on the stage and Erica, join us. And Catherine, why don't you come on too, if you want to? Um, but uh, Erica, let's let's turn now. John, that was just fascinating. We'll come back to many questions that you raised there. But, but um, Erica, let's talk a little bit about the waves of immigration to, to America. And in your book, The Making of Asian America, you write that Asian Americans are often seen as Asian. 
as opposed to being seen as Americans, right? And, uh, you know, they seem to, they come to embody whatever threat the land of their ancestry allegedly poses to the United States. So can you talk about that a little bit? And um, is that unique to Asian Americans or is it something that's shared by other groups as well? Sure. Well, thank you so much for inviting me to join this panel. I've already learned a lot from John, and I'm going to try and either match his prowess in terms of <laughs> hundreds of years of, of history. Um, and he's already set the stage, you know, this theme of awe and repulsion in terms of shaping the history of um, U.S.-China relations, and then how do um, how do Chinese Americans, how do Chinese immigrants fit into it? And I'd like to expand upon that and and perhaps um, add a few more elements. And that is that we should, you know, be looking at the trends of migration, and in particular Asian migration, not only in terms of the the relationship between two countries but of course, larger global trends. So US and European colonialism in Asia and the Americas, how does the history of slavery <laughs> impact Chinese migration to the Americas? Certainly the China trade and its, um, its importance in shaping ideas, American ideas about China. But I think I, I need to emphasize the importance of global migration trends and racism in the United States. So even before, um, even before we have large numbers of Chinese in the United States, as John has already explained, there are pre-existing opinions and conceptions about China and the Chinese people. And John has mentioned the favorable um, perceptions, and I'd like to counter with the negative ones, the ways in which China had not just for the US, but for the West in general, had always been seen as the polar opposite of, um, of, of Europe and the West and seen in a negative light, um, seen as a place to be dominated, to be exploited. As we know, Christopher Columbus discovers America by accident because he is looking for China. He is looking um, as the Western European powers were, were looking to, um, to convert heathens and to um, good Christians, but also to, to take um, the fabled riches from Asia and, and, um, and enrich Europe. So we, we have these, this other side you know, of, of Asia, this other perception of Asia. And when Asians do start coming to the United States, Asian sailors in the 1780s, um, the first Chinese woman uh, recorded into the United States comes to New York City um, and is displayed by two China traders. Uh, her name was Afang Moi, and she, she comes ashore in 1834, and she's exhibited in a, uh, in a hall, and char people are charged you know, a, a few dollars to come in and, and look at her. And then the gold rush. And I might add, um, I'll try to, to personalize this history a little bit with by weaving in my own family's history. Um, my great great grandfather was one of those gold rush um, Chinese migrants seeking to, to make it rich. Uh, mm -hmm. We know that he first came to California as early as 1854, but then uh, fled to the East Coast where he helped to establish New York City's Chinatown uh, by the 1870s. Wow. My grandmothers remained in China. They were um, educated by Christian missionaries in Canton. Um, you know, so we see these ties. We see how these larger global forces of, of U.S. missionaries in China, you know, have direct impacts on, on Chinese migration and Chinese American families. Um, I also want to emphasize that, you know, by the time Chinese and then later Asians entered the United States, they of course are entering into a country that is um, structured around slavery, structured around racism, not just against uh, blacks and, um, uh, but also indigenous uh, Americans and that US expansionist uh, rhetoric and movement that treats Mexicans and Mexican Americans as unequals. So yes, that 1870 Naturalization Act is the, is the first time that Congress is explicitly debating 
whether Chinese and Asians uh, should be allowed to become naturalized citizens, but it's really a reaffirmation of our very first naturalization law, which was 1790, which is explicitly said that only free whites could become naturalized citizens. Mm -hmm. So even before, you know, even before we've got mass migration from Asia, they are, you know, the United States has already been built, right, upon a system of, of white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, and Eric, and yet, was, that, was that debate in uh, 1870 around the Naturalization Act, was that largely around sort of racial issues? Was it framed around race or what was, how was absolutely, it? Absolutely, right? Yeah. It's, it's right after the Civil War, you know. Yeah. So one of right. the important things is to remember how um, the, the rights of Asian immigrants and Asian Americans have always followed or been part of um, debates, larger debates about mm -hmm. race um, and who counts as an American. Um, the anti-Chinese movement uh, in the 1870s and 1880s was absolutely led by the white working class, but they alone could never have achieved you know, the legislative victories that um, the Exclusion Act uh, represented. It's a function of how uh, elites at both parties, um, you know, bought into this anti-Chinese uh, rhetoric, but also because the, the electoral votes of the Pacific Coast were so important by the 1880 election. And, and what the Pacific Coast wanted was Chinese exclusion. And of course, because Asians couldn't become naturalized citizens, they do not have any political power and would not until the 1950s. Mm -hmm. So this period of Chinese exclusion, this is when my family happens to be able to come because we do exclude laborers, but we are allowing, so just like John had said, this you know, this, this awe and repulsion. We, we want students to continue to come. We have to allow diplomats to continue to come. We want the merchants to continue to come and travelers. Um, so one grandfather comes as a son of a merchant. Huh. Um, another grandfather comes as a son of a merchant, but he is a fake son. And that merchant is a fake merchant. That grandfather comes as basically an illegal alien or an undocumented immigrant. These are some of the pathways that Chinese immigrants um, forged during an era of extreme discrimination um, mm -hmm. during the exclusion era. So well, we really don't I just see- jump in yeah. one sec just to ask yeah. you about your grandfathers. Mm -hmm. um, so what kind of, you said son, the, you know, one of them anyway was the son of a merchant. So what kind of trade, do you know anything about the history of what the, and, and why did they want, was it still, was America still viewed or already viewed as a land of great opportunity? Oh, for sure. And this is where you have the, the intersections with global migration. You know, we, we have, the United States has admitted more immigrants than any other country. Mm -hmm. um, the, this is where it gets interesting. You know, the, the lawmakers fashioned the exclusion laws with big business in mind, meaning merchants, you know, the China trade, the continuation of the China uh -huh. trade. But of course, uh, in the United States, Chinese were shut out from almost every profession. Um, and the majority are either restaurant owners or restaurant workers, as my grandparents were, or laundry owners and workers. So the business was a, um, was a restaurant and mm -hmm. Chinese incorporated those restaurants. So maybe if you owned two, you would then um, form a company. So my grandfather's restaurant in Brooklyn, New York was called the New Deal Chow Mein Inn. Wow. And then he had another one um, and the, I just found the stock certificate. It was the New Deal, you know, restaurant company or something like that. Um, this was not what the lawmakers intended, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, it allowed my grandfather to count as a merchant. Um, we really don't see the, the, the roots or the foundations of contemporary Chinese America until after 1965. Um, and that is when the 65 Immigration Act 
um, abolishes those older um, national origins quotas. The exclusion law had been repealed during World War II. Um, and by the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we have 1.5 million Chinese, this includes Hong Kong, Taiwan, and the People's Republic of China mm -hmm. coming in. And according to the Pew Research Center and, and Laura's uh, data from earlier, there's around uh, 5.4 million Chinese in the United States now. It's the largest single Asian origin group. Okay. So it's a long history. And yes, we have to tie it to those larger international trends, but the history of immigration and racism in the United States um, in particular have been especially important as well. Right. So I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, the sort of uh, painting uh, Asian Americans and in particular Chinese Americans as being Chinese instead of American. Um, you know, can you talk about that a little bit? And then I, I, I want to kind of probe that because it seems like a very complicated issue when it comes when you get to the sort of modern era where the Chinese government is playing on you know, recent immigrants, nationalism, patriotism, loyalty, all that kind of stuff. So how, talk about that a little bit and, and how you see those issues. Yeah, so there's a very common complaint that Asian Americans have, and that is being seen as always foreign and never American. Mm -hmm. And it's very much um, exemplified by the question that so many of us get asked often, and that is, where are you from? Yeah. And as I've just mentioned, my family's history goes back six generations. I may be, I'm, you know, more American than my husband who is of Irish and German descent. But if you line us up yeah. and you ask who is the, who is the American, um, I'm probably not going to be the one that gets the vote. So um, this is, you know, despite generations, despite the fact that that you speak better Chinese than I. <laughs> um, and, um, and this is across the board when uh, you're talking about Koreans or Indians or Vietnamese, et cetera. This, has, this again is tied to uh, you know, one of the ways in which American racism works is in yeah. seeing and classifying Asians continually as, as foreign. And then when we're at war with Japan or war, a trade war or cybersecurity war with China, then we become um, the enemy. Mm -hmm. And yet the Chinese government, I mean, it seems to me that, that Chinese in America very often are put, are stuck in the middle because, but, and I'm talking particularly about more recent yeah. uh, immigrants, right? Yes. They, they may still be, they may not be Americans, you know, they may not have American passports, whatever. But the point is they're re more recently from China. Um, you know, the Chinese government does constantly say, you know, kind of, we don't care what passport you have, we're all Chinese. And, uh, you know, we should all be rooting for the rise of China. And so that it seems to me, and also uh, more recent immigrants often do because there's been so much opportunity in China, right? Economic opportunity, uh, intellectual opportunity, all kinds of stuff going on. The Thousand uh, Talents Program, you know, trying to bring Chinese back to uh, China. And so there are many, many linkages um, that make the Chinese population in America vulnerable to accusations that, that they have divided loyalties. You know, I mean, one of the ways to think about it is if we just shifted perspective. I mean, we as American children were raised to be very proud of our country. We're, this is part of nationalism. Mm -hmm. um, and if we go and study abroad and work abroad, it's perfectly okay for us to remain proud Americans. And it's perfectly okay for us. And it's probably expected from our families and from our home country that we return to America as well. Um, and so, you know, for the United States, we, we have this, we have this, you know, really torturous um, relationship with immigrants. We want you to come but we only want you to come to settle permanently. And if you want to settle permanently, then you basically have to give up 
you know, um, give up any any feelings of loyalty to another country, especially if we're, you know, having tense relations. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I think you're you're right in pointing out these uh, these observations about Chinese uh, immigrants feeling caught between, but it it's not it's not anything so new. I, I you know I don't think it's anything so. Um, uh, something that we need to be concerned about. Um, they have have grown up in a time of of rising China and and rising pride in China. Yes. Um, the problem, I think, comes from when various governments um, do pit pit you know <laughs> pit us against the other government and and create um, create these. Uh, um, these negative warlike um, sort of attitudes about uh, that then get extended to people simply because they may be proud of their of their national origin and and do continue to have ties to their home country. Yeah. Um, so, and we'll get to the Justice Department's China Initiative. Um, and I know John, I know you've got thoughts on this, and you know I want to get your thoughts on it as well. But but first, one one last question before we bring Catherine on um, to talk about her experience as a lawyer. Um, so Erica, you also um, recently testified before the House Subcommittee on Civil and Constitutional Rights, um, which you know was the first time that Congress has held hearings on anti-Asian racism in 34 years. But so tell us a little bit about that experience. And you mentioned um, when we were chatting before that there were some difficult headwinds from certain factions. And just tell us a little bit about what that was, what that was like. Right. So uh, yes, I testified before Congress from exactly this room. <laughs> um, so it wasn't your typical congressional hearing. Um, and I was called as a as a witness for the Democrats. And then the Republicans also called uh, witnesses. This was planned weeks, uh, a month before the mass shooting in Atlanta, uh, which happened on, on March 16th. The hearings that were on March 18th. Um, so it wasn't as if we overnight put together congressional hearings. It was planned before, uh, before that. But of course, the, the timeliness, um, the unfortunate timeliness, um, I think raised the stakes considerably. There had been many, many efforts by democratic lawmakers to call attention to the damaging, the damage that the racist rhetoric of China flu, Wuhan flu virus, and Kung flu were having on the Asian American and Pacific Islander community, um, but those those introduction uh, introductory bills were weren't really gaining any traction. Um, so when we held these hearings on March 18th, it was very interesting to see the the divide. Some some very stark, and then some more nuanced. Um, because the Democrats hosted the hearing, the other side was allowed to um, give the first statement. So um, the first statement came from a Republican member of the committee who took the opportunity. Again, this was a hearing on anti-Asian discrimination and violence. And eight people had just been murdered in Atlanta, six of whom were Asian American women. The first statement came from a Republican mem member of Congress who used his time to question how the hearings um, were, he felt, an infringement on his free speech because he wanted to be able to continue to criticize what he called the chai comms. And that if, um, well, anyway, he questioned the validity of the hearings. And um, he also focused, again, he focused mostly on what he believed was the danger of China and suggested um, the use of what's well, called them the bad guys and said that where he came from, they knew how to deal with bad guys and he made a reference to lynching. So that was the beginning of the hearing. And then there were others who chose to bring up the issue of affirmative action um, and use that as an example of discrimination against um, Asian Americans. So there were 
uh, there was a great diversity of views and perspectives. And to me, it just highlighted the, <laughs> the way in which Washington DC can work, but also just the complexity um, yeah. of, of these issues. Yeah. Wow. Amazing. Okay. So Catherine, let's, let's thank you so much, Eric, and we'll come back, you know, we'll have a, a group conversation in a minute, but Catherine, um, join us if you haven't, let's see, are you on, are you with us? Um, I wanted to, I mean, Catherine, you have been right smack in the middle of, uh, all of this through various legal cases over the past year, uh, dealing with the Trump policy, the ban, in particular, the, the part of it that I know a little bit about or that I've heard a little bit about is dealing with the Trump policy that banned stock listings um, of companies, any companies that were connected to the Chinese military, uh, Chinese companies connected to the Chinese military. And you recently won some sort of case. Can you tell us tell us what you can about that? And, and it, I think, gives us some really fascinating perspective on you know, what's been going on in terms of the pressure on uh, businesses in the states um, that you know, has, has been uh, emerging over the past year or two. So go ahead, Catherine, tell us about that. Oh, good evening, Dinda. Thank you and James for inviting me. Um, and I really enjoyed the conversations that we were having so far. Um, I'll tell you the about the case in a minute. But let me tell you where I came from. Okay, great. So I came to the United States um, in my late 20s to pursue my law career. I started as a law school student here, um, basically restarting my entire law school education again here um, using the English as my language. Um, that's a language that I learned in high school. Um, so I came here as a first generation immigrant. Mm -hmm. And from, and from Beijing, right? From Shanghai. Oh, Shanghai. Okay, forgive from me. Shanghai. Yeah, yeah, and I was originally from Fudan University. So okay. I'm, and I'm my, as you know, my study here was entirely sponsored by the generous American people. It was a full scholarship law school study. Um, and until today, as I told my mom, I just couldn't understand. I've never met these people um, in the law school financial office uh, officers, and I have never met with the sponsors who financed a very expensive law school study. Um, until today, I don't know some of them, but I can tell that um, American people are a very, very generous and decent people. And everything I have in life now, I owe it to this country. I just feel so privileged to be here. Um, and I feel like um, I owe a lot of uh, appreciation and gratitude towards the generations of Chinese Americans, African Americans, and the leaders in the civil rights movements ahead of me. I'm sure their efforts made my life much better here today. So that's where I came from. I came to this country to uh, pursue an American dream and to um, basically uh, seek opportunities, right? For myself and for my family. Um, and I am, um, I'm drawn to the American value, rule of law, um, the US constitution. I'm one of the nerdy people here who would say, I really, really love our constitution. And that's why I became a lawyer, right? In the first place. But I am um, a little bit concerned. I think that might be a, some of an understatement, but I am concerned by some of the developments in the last few years, um, starting from the keys that Dinda, you're asking about, then I'll give you a few more examples. Mm -hmm. So um, of course the case is still ongoing. So I will limit my comment to the public part of it because mm -hmm. I don't want to be viewed as trying to influence the judge down the road. But basically, uh, towards the end of um, President Trump, um, there was a, um, ex an executive order uh, put in place banning American uh, investors investing into the securities of Chinese companies that are viewed as um, ch communist Chinese military companies. And I, I understand the underlying policy and the rationale behind the executive order 
and the designation of the military companies. However, um, the um, the law and the executive order was very um, in, made in a very broad stroke uh, kind of fashion. So if you look at the list of the companies, I'm sure there are some real military companies there, but then there are other companies such as Xiaomi, Luoquang, those well-known commercial technology, consumer electronics companies from China. And they're just here to do business, right? But somehow, the concept of when you are Chinese, you're foreign. When you're foreign, you are a spy or an enemy, or you are somehow a military company. Um, that's extremely, I think, a broad stroke. And uh, so we won the injunction from a DC court to uh, enjoin the application of the presidential order and this uh, DOD's designation against our client and also um, their stock is allowed to continue trading on the NASDAQ. So I'm very happy for this uh, outcome. Of course, this is a temporary outcome. It's a preliminary injunction. The case is still ongoing, but I think from what we can see from the court ruling, which is a public document, um, the rule of law, which I truly loved. And remember I was drawn to this country because U.S. Constitution and the rule of law was not really respected there because there was not enough due process and evidence to support that kind of administrative action against a private company. Mm -hmm. And also the consequences are felt by thousands and thousands of American citizens because they are the investors of this company, these companies, right? Mm -hmm. And they're impacted by these executive orders. And in my view, some of these orders are arbitrary and capricious, right? Borrowing a term from the Administrative Procedure Act. So you have to follow these due process. Mm -hmm. And other um, cases that I've handled involve a lot of, um, I do a lot of work in the biotech space because of my background. So um, a lot of my cases involve uh, scientists, professors at universities or doctors working at hospitals, they got investigated by DOJ and FBI under the so-called China Initiative mm -hmm. for allegedly uh, spying on the US to benefit China and for other crimes, right? Can I just pause for a second to sort of, um, I, I'm gonna give a broad brush description, but the, the China Initiative is basically a Department of Justice initiative, which instructs the, it, it's, it's uh, you know, sort of instructs the Department of Justice to specifically focus, go out of its way to focus on Chinese entities and Chinese people working in the United States, right? Um, I mean, it's, I'm simplifying. Uh, well, the DOJ is a lot more careful because they didn't say, you know, just Chinese people or Chinese okay. American. Okay. It basically uh, people or entities with China tied and then, um, and then they do IP theft or espionage or other kind of uh, illegal conducts that benefit uh, China. Mm -hmm. And that's the focus of China Initiative. China Initiative started in, uh, I think, November, 2018 mm -hmm. um, as a um, enforcement initiative, meaning um, the government is putting a lot of resources together to focus on these prosecution and investigations. So I am, and I am fully aware there are actually real spies out there and there are espionage and cyber attacks. So I'm not naive about it, mm -hmm. but the reality is if you look at the data disclosed by uh, government agencies such as NIH, NSF, and also um, DOJ, most of these cases especially in the last few years when the China Initiative started, the vast majority of these cases are disclosure cases, meaning the people subject, the scientists, the doctors, and the researchers subject to the investigations are not really spies and they didn't do tech transfers to China. They didn't steal IP. All they did was they forgot or they failed to disclose certain foreign ties 
in their disclosure documents when they apply for federal grants. For example, they might be a very renowned professor, right? The Charles Lieber case, Professor Charles Lieber from Harvard University. He was a um, professor as a thousand year talent professor. Uh, 天人计划, right? Thousand yeah, years. Thousand talent. Yeah. Thousand. Right. And then he didn't disclose that to um to the federal grant making agencies. Now, don't get me wrong, I understand, of course, uh, the breach of the um disclosure rules um uh, could be a violation, right? It could be a violation of the um uh, False Claims Act, because you are using taxpayers' money to fund the research. And of course, the ben the, that research should benefit the American people first and foremost. So you should have a straightforward and full disclosure. However, I have to say these disclosure mistakes are very, very different from spying or IP theft, mm -hmm. right? And then to use that kind of prosecutory power uh, against those scientists and professors who were just not really good at paperwork. A lot of these mistakes were paperwork mistakes that they innocently made. Mm -hmm. So I've been advocating for an am amnesty program. Basically, um, the United States has done this before in the tax area, right? So if you are a US citizen and you have a Swiss bank account and you didn't disclose it, under your tax and under your foreign bank account, the FBAR disclosure requirements, the government gave you an immunity, a period of time to disclose it, and you are exempt from prosecution and criminal liability. So it's kind of a one time or you know, a pass, a, a second chance. Mm -hmm. and, and see here, we're talking about scientists, doctors, and researchers who are just brilliant. They are the people who are really doing cutting edge scientific research. They can do so much for this country and they're American citizens, right? So why not give them a second chance to get clean on right. the disclosure issues and move forward rather right. than the current atmosphere at American universities and research institutions is pretty severe. A lot of Chinese Americans are really scared. They are really concerned about even traveling to China, yeah. right? Or even having co-publishing a paper with a Chinese colleague. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this now listening today to John, Erica, and then um, Laura, I kind of understand where it came from, right? The concept of that you're Chinese American, more Chinese, more American. And therefore, because you're Chinese, you're foreign. And because you're foreign, you are either a spy or an enemy, right? Back to that military company cases and then the espionage yeah. cases. It kind of ties it together for me. Yeah. So yeah. I'm finding these cases um, one at a time and is still hoping to uphold our constitution and the rule of law. Right. Um, but overall, I'm really still grateful to this country and I don't want these little problems to take away the greatness of this country and the people here. Mm -hmm. So that's that's fascinating. Uh, and I, I'd like to actually, I, I, I would love to draw everybody else into this conversation for a minute too, just to, to put probe a little bit um, further into this question of the Chinese government and its connections to Chinese who are in America. It kind of co goes back to what I was asking Erica a little bit about earlier, but you know, because the fact is the Chinese government of course does have um, more control over Chinese companies. At least it has the ability to access data from Chinese companies if it wants to. So. You know, in, a, in the context of the, the United States and China being strategic competitors, which is what the United States is now calling it, you know, how can the U.S. deal with that? And, when, you know, when the two countries are strategic competitors and you've got, uh, you know, Chinese scientists who have, uh, are doing all sorts of uh, research, both here in the States and in China, and you've got companies that are, you know, with investments um, in both countries, I would just love to hear you all talk about this a little bit more in terms of um, the complexity of it, you know, there, because it is complex. I mean, Chinese, the Chinese government, you know, Chinese companies are not the same as American companies in terms of the Chinese government's ability to um, 
you know, uh, have some sort of influence over them, right? So I, I don't know, I'm sure, John, you must have some thoughts on this. I completely agree with you that this is a really tangled issue because you have sort of a mix of all sorts of misconceptions, preconceptions, uh, deeply held beliefs that Americans have about China and the Chinese have about the United States happening in this mm. period of time where we're now entering strategic competition and we view them as a strategic competitor. And clearly the PRC views the United States as its strategic competitor as well. Yeah. This, this yeah. is not this is not a yeah. one-way street here. No, no, true. Yeah. And, and it's and it's I think it's a highly complex issue because you have the Justice Department uh, and the intelligence <laughs> Of the United States confronting significant espionage. And in order to deal with that, they've gone after the fly with a hammer. And in the process, they, as, as Catherine has noted very clearly, have destroyed numerous lives in this country of people who might have made it a, literally a clerical error uh, as they've sought to try to stem what has been a significant flow of Chinese intelligence from this country to China. Um, and that's, I think, a really difficult because the problem of espionage is real, but the problem of prosecutorial overreach, ethnic profiling, racism as well is also real. And mixing those two things has been, has really created this, this really nasty concoction we're, we're facing with right now. And, and add to that COVID, add to that the, the, the xenophobia of, of President Trump, and you've got a really nasty, uh, and it's difficult for the Biden administration to pull back from that as well, because as we saw from Laura's um, slides, anti-China sentiment sells, right? Um, and right, 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 right. That's, that's a difficult mix, I think, clearly. Right. And I can't help but throw in the McCarthy era, you know, reference. I mean, you know, John, you talked about that historically and the Manchurian candidate and all that. And, you know, it's like, um, and, and John, you mentioned lives being destroyed. You know, we had Professor Xi Xiaoxing from, uh, you know, who's a leading head of the physics department at university, oh gosh, I'm forgetting. But anyway, a very prominent physicist who was, you know, accused by the FBI of espionage and his life was completely destroyed. And they basically, uh, you know, they recently dropped the case so that's a victory for him. But in the meantime, he's lost all of his work and he's lost his reputation. So, you know, you're, what you said, John, about going after a fly, you know, going after flies with a hammer um, is what I really, really worry about. Um, but, uh, you know, so, but it's, yeah, it's, I think this, it's, it's a very, very, uh, you know, complicated issue. And I'm curious about, you know, on one hand, we have the anti-Asian hate bill moving through Congress that would in theory be about, you know, raising awareness of hate crimes during the pandemic. But at the same time, we still have the China initiative in the Department of Justice, uh, you know, which seems, these seem very contradictory. And I don't know if you see any, you know, what steps might be taken going forward to kind of make our way through this and find some kind of a balance. Uh, that's a great question. Luckily, I'm not a policymaker. <laughs> but I mean, I think it's it, it's a huge it's a huge issue. I think it, the anti Asian American uh, hate hate crime bills I think extremely important. But the reality is the espionage problem continues. The question is how to devolve, devise a policy that doesn't end up basically ex, you know blowing up the whole relationship um, or and ruining all these lives but at the same time can begin to confront the reality of, of, of PRC espionage in this country. And it's a huge challenge, yeah. uh, especially given the increasing bifurcation and the, and, and the tensions in the relationship. And the fact that the PRC does as a government seem to think it benefits from highlighting racial divisions in the United States, because they benefit from this, right? Because they can say, look at your country, look at your democracy, look at your racism. You're not a model for anybody um, and rightly so. Right, they can make that argument. Yeah. So well, they, so they yeah. In, some, in some cases, can, can can actually, you know, sort of benefit, like I said, from from the tensions in our society, it's just as, as does Putin as well. And to be sure, um, there are certain sectors of the United States that also benefits, right? The anti-China rhetoric sells during the Trump administration. Blame China. His constant refrain about. Uh, why the pandemic was so bad in the United States, 
that benefited him, you know, mm. and, 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 and it rallied his supporters to, to his cause so much so that they defended him, you know, with, with violence. Um, you know, the, the challenge here is again, you know, we're talking here at the China Institute about the, the connections between US China policy and, um, and Chinese immigrants. And yes, there are connections, but at the same time, you know, how do we move forward in terms of a US, um, US policies that protect US interests without, um, as Congresswoman Grace Meng said during the congressional hearings, putting a bullseye on the backs of Asian Americans. You know, how is it that when the United States is um, getting tough with China, it is Asian Americans that pay the price. Whereas when we're tough with Russia, we don't see a 2,600% increase in hate incidents directed at people of Russian descent, right? It's going back to that tangled web of US-China relations and US racism. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure. I, I know one of the questions is, um, what gives you hope, or do we have any optimism? And and as a historian, you know, I can see that these patterns have have been part of our history for a long time. At the same time, you know, there are certain moments of of inflection, of reckoning, of change. Um, so the fact that we did have congressional hearings, that there is a, a, a hate crimes act that should pass the House is, and that we do have a president who during his first week condemned anti-Asian racism and xenophobia. These are all uh, positive signs. My, my, my criticism with something like the hate crimes bill is that if you read it very carefully, it is specifically tied to the pandemic. It's specifically tied to mitigating racist um, rhetoric related to the pandemic. So it does treat what we're seeing at this rise in anti-Asian violence as just a pandemic thing. Whereas we know that it could not have happened without a really long standing undercurrent of, of anti-Asian racism that, um, that's been part of our history for a long time. So I'm gonna share with you my favorite question. I, let's, Laura, why don't you come back onto the, onto the screen if you will, and let's take some questions from the audience. Um, so we just have about 10 more minutes, but my favorite question is addressed to me. And it says, Dinda, would the question of divided loyalties come up if there was a Swedish American person with strong cultural and family ties to Sweden? It's very much Erica, as you were suggesting, you know, when we Americans, you know, travel overseas, of course, it's expected that we'll be proud and patriotic and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, I think it's a great question. Um, but so let's see, uh, another question. Um, okay, somebody's asking you, John, a historical question um, saying, regarding uh, the working class whites being the cause of anti-Chinese sentiment, um, back in the days of the Exclusion Act. So the question is, isn't it true that the Exclusion Act also coincided with reconstruction and the racist reaction to it and the subjugation of China by Western forces? No, I, I, I totally agree with that. I, and, and Erica pointed out that, uh, I mean, I, I kind of, I was trying to compact a lot of history in, in five minutes, but there were clearly elites in the United States that benefited greatly from the move to exclude it, uh, and to uh, in, 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 in institute racist policies against the Chinese. I mean, you just look actually San Francisco as a tiny um, uh, example of that. Um, in San Francisco, the, many of the laundries that were built literally out of bricks were owned by the French and many of the Chinese laundries were built out of wood and the San Francisco Board of Supervisors passed an ordinance that basically said you couldn't have laundries built out of wood, but you could have laundries built out of bricks. And that obviously completely hurt the, the Chinese laundrymen and benefited the French laundry people. So it's not simply an issue of the working class, clearly. This right. was an institutional racist system that benefited whites uh, over the Chinese. And mm -hmm. the American elite, the white elite, cottoned onto it, saw that it was useful in terms of getting votes as well, um, and you have uh, sort of a, the, the worst combination you could imagine. So it's not simply the white working class. 
as yeah. a proud union member, I, I mean, you know, so <laughs> I'm not, I'm not out there, there to bash my brothers and sisters <laughs> in union work, but nonetheless, so. So here's another question. Um, somebody's saying, okay, so, so ignorance is the prime cause of anti-Asian racism and Sinophobia generally. So the question is, do you all have any thoughts on what could be done at a school level to include education on Asian and Asian American history, or Chinese um, history and Chinese uh, in America history, or other methods with, with, with which we could combat this kind of problem? Could I jump in here for one second? Yeah, and please. I think I'd just suggest Erica has an amazing project, and you have to tell us about the project of getting people to put in their, their stories on this website you've created. That's but okay. that's, that's I, so, I just love yeah. that idea. So. Wonderful. Okay, so tell us about that. Oh, well, thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, it's, <laughs> um, it's called Immigrant Stories. So I direct the Immigration History Research Center at the University of Minnesota. And if you go to immigrantstories.umn.edu, it's a digital storytelling website that allows anyone anywhere to write, record, uh, upload images and then edit a um, and to create a video, basically a digital story for free. And it is available in seven languages, including uh, including Chinese. Um, and it's it's really our our attempt to try to first of all bring in more of this um, our diverse stories and 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 experiences into the the larger. Um, realm that is the United States, but also to try to challenge what are some of these overarching stereotypes um, about immigrants um, and refugees in particular. Um, so it is part of an educational effort, and it is our hope that um, instead of facts and figures and names and dates, that individual human stories, you know, my family story, can help break down some of those barriers. Mm -hmm. and this is, there's just a survey that was published today um, in the Boston Globe that said, um, when asked in a poll to name a prominent Asian American, the top answer was don't know. And this is after our first black and Asian American and female vice president. Um, the, the answers ranged from Jackie Chan, <laughs> to Bruce Lee. Those were the, the, after don't know, it was Jackie Chan and Bruce Lee. So the need for, uh, and no disrespect to Jackie Chan or Bruce Lee, yeah. but Asian American history is much, much, much bigger than, um, than those two. Um, and the fact that we really don't have uh, any substantive um, lessons or curriculum is, is really a travesty, not only for um, Asian American students, but really we're seeing the repercussions. We're seeing it now when in the, in the gaps or, or the absence of any real knowledge of Asian Americans have been here in the United States for you know, 200 plus years, all we have are the, the proliferation of the grossest, meanest stereotypes, the China virus, the Kung flu. Mm -hmm. And when it's whipped up and accelerated, um, like a, a, a match to a fire, we see these vicious um, attacks that people are so um, triggered to see an Asian face and to um, identify that Asian face with all of the pain and hurt and anxiety of the pandemic that they are attacking them. So this, this, this the anti-racism has to begin in our schools and it has to begin early and often. Mm -hmm. And I will say that uh, I absolutely, you know, what, so well put, Erica, thank you for that. And um, I'm proud to say that China Institute, we have a wonderful program, which is called We All Live in the Forbidden City, which is a, um, a fabulous sort of educational tool that goes out into the public schools and you know, gives kids an introduction to kind of what China's all about. And, and we're going to be working, you know, we've been talking to the Board of Education also about what uh, can be done to uh, bring more education uh, about China and, you know, the story of, of uh, China, China and Chinese in America uh, into the schools because it's so important. So I wanted to ask you all, um, 
Firstly, take a look. Uh, our, my colleague Aaron has been posting things like the Boston Globe article and links to your books, so that everybody can go on go on to the um, the chat area and and uh, find your books there. So, but I, I wanted to ask you all, what do you think? You know, question to throw up to all of you: What do you think um, the United States can do? So, part of it, I guess, is this: you know, more education in the schools. What can the United States do, and what can China do? to try to, um, you know, ameliorate this situation. Anybody, any takers? I would say education is a two-way street. So I heard what Erica said, but then in the survey that Laura shared with us, a lot of people are saying we should have less Chinese students yes. in the United States. I think it's a majority survey. Um, but in my view, the generations of Chinese students that were educated in the US, maybe they came here for college or grad school, or even just for a short, a few months of exchange programs, a lot of them returned to their home country with very favorable views of American people and American value. And those generations of um, students who were benefited from the American education system, I think they will still act as so-called ambassadors, right? And, and they would be out there building bridges. Um, even though I think at country to country, maybe national level, the atmosphere is really bad right now. But um, from a citizen to citizen perspective, I think there are still a lot of deep roots of friendship a mutual appreciation and mutual respect. Um, I, uh, one of the governors, uh, former governors also reached out to me today to talk about um, what we can do to build US-China business to help different states and um, municipals in the United States that need investments that have a lot of communities that are badly hurt by COVID-19 and need investments. And then China can bring in investments and jobs and other opportunities. So at you know state to state governors level, uh, mayors level, um, people are still talking about um, uh, you know what kind of business cooperations we can have with Chinese private enterprises to bring jobs and to bring opportunities here. So I think whether it's education or private enterprises. These civil society um, level of cooperation and exchange is still very, very important because I think, I still think that's the foundation of a healthy and sustainable relationship, right? I, I don't want the US and China to have a cold war because I still have my, a lot of my loved ones and friends back in China and they don't want to have a war with the US either. And I think it's that level, civil society level of bond and friendship that will hold back the two countries from doing something drastic. Mm -hmm. right, so wasn't there some saying that if it's up to women and mothers, there wouldn't be any war in this world? Right. So if we all have friends and business partners in each country, we wouldn't want to have that kind of horrible relationship with each other. Yeah. It seems like the people to people relationships, which is certainly what uh, China Institute is all about, but also better storytelling on both sides. In other words, uh, you know, storytelling in America about the benefits of, you know, Chinese investment in the United States and that kind of thing. And the same thing going on in China, it seems to be, is, it seems to me is incredibly important in terms of helping kind of um, soften people's views um, and help them see the benefits of cross-cultural exchange. John, were you going to throw something in there? Uh, no, I just say to Catherine's point, I think it was a good thing that the U.S. Embassy in Beijing has begun to go through the backlog of Chinese student visa applications and begin to issue some Chinese visas. Uh, oh, just, have they? Oh. Yeah, they started. They did a pretty lousy kind of campaign because they threw a puppy dog into the uh, into the mix, and that didn't really sit very well with some 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 folks in China, understandably. But the, the backlog, they're beginning to deal with that. And that's 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 a good beginning. 
but you know, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, right. There's a lot of bad blood, but the problem, one of the problems in improving US China ties is that you have to have, uh, you have to tango, tango takes, takes two to dance together. And, and on, the, on the PRC side, there's not a whole hell of a lot of willingness on the side of Beijing to really see a, a good relationship with the United States either. So it's it's not simply the, you know um, you can't you can't simply get the Biden administration to, to modify its policy and, unless you have Beijing modifying its policy mm -hmm. too, and that's difficult. I think it's challenging in these days. So well, let's hope for more educational exchange, more uh, intellectual exchange, civil society exchange, as you suggested, Catherine, and and um, you know business, which once upon a time was the ballast that sort of uh, you know held the relationship steady. So we are so honored to have um, all four of you with us tonight. Laura, Erica, John, Catherine, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, thank you so much to our audience. We hope you'll come back again. Um, I learned so much tonight. I hope you all feel you learned a lot. Um, and uh, thanks so much to all of you for, for adding so much nuance to this very complicated conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Again soon. Bye. Bye.